maybe the uh, most abstract important thing to know about me to situate myself in this report back is that I am the granddaughter of the Maya Mom people who have been split by the border of the state of Mexico and the state of Guatemala. And that I am the daughter of undocumented migrants from Guatemala here on occupied Chumash and Tambala. Uh, and due to an endless number of regrettable historical events, I have U.S. citizenship. And so this has allowed me to travel to Palestine and Chiapas um, and back. And so, um, let's see. Yeah, so with that fact, borders have always been something that have been on my mind as a kid because it's been in the creation story of my life, you know, my parents crossing this way. And so borders have always been something very violent and um, something that I later got the opportunity to understand when I went to university and encountered something called geography. Um, which I always really loved maps growing up. I think maybe a lot of people get fascinated. I, I realize I'm not ever the only one. Like maps really fascinate us. And um, I went to Cal State Northridge here in the Valley and I studied business admin in the 90s with a specialization in information systems as the internet was becoming more mainstream in the 90s. And I wanted to be able to get a job because that's why, you know, most of us go to the Cal State. Cal State's treat us like workers, so, you know, and the UCs treat students like thinkers. So there's a split that exists in how knowledge is uh, understood in this society. So we'll talk more about that. So at Cal State Northridge, I was learning capitalism, you know, without it being called that. It's just called business. <laughs> and in the 90s, the solution for everything in our business classes was globalization. You just go export the work out somewhere to China. It's like this was when it was all really starting to explode in the 90s, this idea of globalization. Because the Soviet Union had just fallen at the beginning of the 90s, which ended the so-called Cold War, the Cold War, cold between NATO and the USSR, but hot for the rest of the world. And Guatemala being an enormous casualty of this war, the Maya genocide took place during the so-called Cold War between the state of Guatemala and the Maya people. That ongoing genocide of 500 years on these lands. And also the CIA had overthrown the democratically elected president of, of a Watem uh, president's administration of Guatemala in the 50s. It was the second regime the CIA had overthrown. The first one was Iran in 1953. So this is what was going on in the so-called Cold War. There's nothing cold about it, depending on what your perspective is, right? So is it, uh, we have this book um, called World War IV. It's a compilation we just put together of the Zapatistas, theorizations of war. They've been theorizing that we're already in the Fourth World War, and that's something that is really important to talk about right now, as folks keep saying, is World War III about to start? We already did World War III. With the fall of the Soviet Union, that battle had been NATO versus the USSR. The first world was NATO. That was the world of free market capitalism. And then the second world, the USSR, which had the state communist model. And then, oh. <laughs> um, and so the third world, the rest of the world, was supposed to pick, you know, and then it was a fourth world, which was even like way even outside of whatever the third world. And so with with the so-called Cold War. Uh, which is the Third World War, coming to an end in the 90s when the Soviet Union fell. Since then, we've had this entire celebration of capitalism since the 90s. 
and immediately, you know, we start getting all of these wars, like the, the Gulf War of 1990-91, that never seemed to end, even under the Clinton administration later. And then with 9-11, things really became exposed that now we're in a war where the enemy can be anywhere. And there was like after 9-11, there was this whole push from the US government that if you that if you see something, say something, but like cultivating a whole society of snitches, right? Like it's like and see, what do you mean see something? You know, without saying what that seeing was, like it was already activating the pre-existing codes of this country, very right? white supremacist codes. Also something really important at that time, as someone who did not grow up white, very brown, in this white supremacist society, I saw something fascinating on 9-11, and that is in the popular imagination, our Arab relatives and Muslim Arab relatives come down like to the below. Like immediately they were, everybody was seen as an enemy. It didn't matter even if they weren't Muslim, if they looked Muslim, then they were enemies, right? And so that and so that was the feeling with 9-11, was that the enemy can be anywhere, sleeper cell, neighbor, in the suburbs kind of thing. There was even TV shows about this. And so this was going on around me, and I had always been really political in my family, and maybe it's related because I was to the only I was the only one that had citizenship because I was the only one born here. And politics, where injustice really um, uh, concerned me because of how I would see myself and my family be treated. Um, and because I, I felt empowered to do something, maybe that's why I was into politics. And I was really into, I mean, I was kind of raised, I was raised by my family and raised by television. So I was raised into Americana through television, right? Lots of nonsense, right? Like that's how you learn the codes because your parents don't know, your grandma sure don't know, like, you know, what this cliche term means. Like you learn all the cliches and those codes. Um, or I, anyway, I did. I did. Um, I'm just seeing so many nods. <laughs> um, and so I learned uh, that I was a Democrat through television. You know, my family sure didn't tell me that. That's what I learned because they were the ones that were always sticking up for people like us. And then I was so into politics. Um, I randomly ended up just because I wanted to go see it snow because I'd never seen it snow. I went to on a national student exchange program while I was at Cal State Northridge to go to a Rutgers and the University of Maryland. And while I was there, I randomly got an internship in Washington DC in Congress because I was a graphic designer and then he was a graphic designer. And then I was just giving tours of the Capitol as if I knew what I was talking about and I learned a lot when I was there. But it's something that I kind of realized that about that space is that in Washington DC there was a couple of heartbreaks that took place and it was 2001, January. George W. Bush had just been inaugurated and it was shocking that there was no resistance to his inauguration because he had just stolen the election. And so I'm in Congress as this is happening and I'm thinking the Democrats are gonna put up a fight and they're completely normalizing it. And not only that, then I find out that their roommates, the Republicans and the Democrats and that they're lovers and that some of them are married and that they don't, they don't really seem to have existential questions that they are talking about it's more like a sporting event it felt like they just like different teams so they go home and then it just be like their own regular life and so it was a heartbreak for me i remember when i was there i first heard the the, the name bernie sanders it was in the context of him always being made fun of and the independent socialist from vermont bernie sanders like that would always be his prefix like that was a joke because Back in the day, like, if you were a socialist, you were a joke, you know, like, you don't even bring up, cap like, capitalism was so normalized growing up. And, um, so yeah, that's a heartbreak, um, seeing that that just wasn't going to be the space, and not knowing what to do after that. And then 9-11 happens right away. Nine months later, 9-11 happens. And 
And I see Yasser Arafat giving blood, donating blood. And I had always seen him growing up, you know, he'd be called a terrorist, that he hated America. And I'm over here seeing, like, he's sympathetic to what happened in New York and the Northeast. And so I asked, started to ask these questions, started to try to study, but I didn't know anybody that I trusted. Like, I didn't know any Muslims. I didn't know any Palestinians. Uh, my boss were Zionists, sadly, and they were just not being helped. I ended up quitting my job. I couldn't. We were uh, in Chicago at a furniture trade show in the World Trade Center in Chicago when 9-11 happened in New York, and so the whole thing shut down. And we were just, everybody there was just, all the vendors were just watching the news. And um, I really had all of these questions and nobody, no mentorship. And so, um, you know, I, I discovered Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, when it first came out, it was this huge fight. Because Encyclopedia Britannica was pissed because, you know, they, they lost a lot of money and they were trying to delegitimize Wikipedia. But then there was a whole research study done that showed that Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica have the exact same amount of errors. <laughs> so then, you know, Wikipedia, I started to read about the creation of the State of Israel because with 9-11, that had been one of the reasons cited for what happened for, for what OBL had done, and I was like, "What's going on over there?" You know, because and and I had always just de facto supported Israel just because I had no idea who the Palestinians were. I had never heard. I first heard even of Israel when I was nine, over at Oxnard College Auditorium. My cousin who just come from Guatemala. Uh, to study because my tia, she didn't want her to go to university in Guatemala because she'd become a Marxist, so she sent her over here. <laughs> the 80s. So, uh, 1988, I go to this play. Like, my prima's gonna be in a play. She hardly knows any English right on. Let's go. I want to go see. And, and I go, and I was like her friend. I was like her young friend. I later found out that she learned English from just hanging out with me, you know. And uh, it was uh, the diary of Anna Frank. And it was the first time I, I, I even heard of anything like that. And especially about Europe, because on TV, Europe has it all together. You know, white people got it all together, and they're over here. What? Um, I asked the adult, is this true? Is this a true story? We can't just change, rewrite the ending. Like, this is true. And that's they said, yeah, it happened. But none of them could tell me why. And so it was a huge question that I had, but I was, you know, relieved right away by knowing that they were, that, that Jews in, from Europe were safe now. We can see Israel and the United States takes care of the Israel really nice. That's, that was my growing up. This is what happens when you're raised by television, right? When you're a migrant kid, because you're raised by two different worlds, by Univision, <laughs> it's as close as the television part. Um, so, you know, it was, I started in the early 2000s, right before 9 11, started seeing on the news the voices that were defending the Palestinians. Um, because it was all over the news, these suicide bombs and and the, and the Palestinians are this and that. And I was like, who are the Palestinians? Because somebody said, well, the Palestinians are suffering. And I was like, what? So then I started to do research, and I got so confused because um, the mainstream was saying something. So Wikipedia was a really nice entry point for me to start seeing, like, well, who said this? Because that's a really cool thing about Wikipedia is that, like, it, it's a nice surface beginning, and then you go check the citations yourself right to see and then that can lead you into this really cool rabbit hole of research <laughs> and so i got really curious about palestine in um especially after 9 11 and it was mostly books that accompanied me and i was just still very confused until around 2005 i had um gone through this journey where i had been in the business school at cal state northridge did the whole uh, East Coast, go see the snow and intern, and then come back, and then 9-11 happened, and so I started getting ready to graduate. And I needed it, in order to get my financial aid, I had to take a full load. 
So I took all these electives, and one of them was urban geography because I wanted to know why LA was laid out like LA was laid out. And I was good at technology, and I love maps, and this whole GIS, geographic information system coming up. You know, you can see the world with maps. And I'm like, yes, we need to save the world. <laughs> and I can make maps. Um, and so that, that was a whole experience because I entered grad school. And now in grad school in geography, whoa, my first class was called globalization. And so that, now I'm learning about globalization from below, whereas across the quad, I was learning about globalization from above. The solution for making money is you just export everything out to China. That, that was the discourse in the 90s. And now in geography, we have this book called Empire in our hands. And I had never read anything that thick, and I didn't know what they were talking about, but I saw the name Marx. I'm like, oh my god, is this legal? You can talk about Marx? <laughs> for real? No, I didn't know. Because I, I grew up with like the Cold War, and like, they're, you know, the communists and that. Um, but they were like totally normalizing it, and, and I just found that a lot of the books, the little bit that I could understand, was like really blowing my mind. Uh, there's a term for it now that I use called conceptual curanderismo, you know, conceptual healing that I learned from the conceptual curanderas in Mexico, uh, who are, you know, together with the compas, the zapatistas we'll talk about. Because that's exactly where I learned about the Zapatistas, was in these globalization classes in geography. And it's not that geography is this really amazing discipline, it's that Marxist, feminist, and anarchists have done a lot of really amazing work in the discipline. And even though there aren't very many, they get cited all over with other disciplines. And so then they become a force, because that's the way academia works, is how many people cite you. And so then, whether you like them or not, if you're in geography, in human geography, you have to know that the Marxist geographers exist. You have to know that the anarchists and the feminist geographers exist, whether you like it or not. And so, if you're a curious person, right, maybe, maybe that'll open up some paths. And that's what happened with me. I started to see the easy LN in all of this global, you know, globalization protests, anti-FTAA anti protests, I'm like, what's going on? There's protests. Like, it was really a whole shift from being like, how are we going to run capitalism in the business school over to then geography, like the world's on fire because of capitalism. You know, and so then you start seeing free Palestine and easy land together. Well, that's what I started to see, and I'm like, what? Like. We got a free Palestine. Like, oh, let me learn more. And I just became uh, so curious about both the EZLN and Palestine because of all of this movement taking place. And this is the early 2000s. And this is when uh, there was a lot of consciousness of how these supranational institutions, like the the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank like how they indebt countries of the former third world, right, into completely structure, uh, restructurizing so that, restructuring themselves so that they no longer spend on anything on healthcare and education, so no social spending. It's more about creating a situation where your country protects private property has infrastructure to move goods and mine and extractive is you know extractive uh, mining or water can build infrastructure and um basically that's making it a welcome business climate for capital and who are in the way lots of native people especially here on this continent many of us are still around fighting protecting the land and those are people who are in the way and this is what the ezln said with the Fourth World War, it's a war of capital versus anything that gets in the way, which ends up, at the logical conclusion, being life. And if we see now, 30 years after they first started talking about it, we're in a situation of extinction. It's no longer uh, being talked about in whispers underground, like it's more mainstream that we are in the sixth planetary extinction and these performative 
conferences like the COP that just you know the one that just happened in the Gulf and that those are conferences of the greatest polluters who then make global decisions about how we're going to stop this. You know, so what's happening right now is we're seeing like a resurgence of a lot of this consciousness of how the fuck is the world working now? Because we're told it's supposed to be working this way. And we're seeing that so much of it is a lie. And not only is it a lie, we're being gaslit into not believing our own eyes. You know, so that was early 2000s. That's how a lot of people were understanding. There was a, a film that came out, a documentary I really recommend. It's free to stream online. It's called The Fourth World War. And that came out right after 9-11 because what the Zapatistas were saying with their writings on the Fourth World War in the early, in the 90s was that the Fourth World War as a war of capital against life. It's a situation where nation states have no longer decided there's a problem with capital. Their fight is over power and influence, but there really isn't a question of whether capitalism or no capitalism, like there used to be back during the Third World War. And so the enemy is anything that can get in the way. It's not even like a nationality that's an enemy. It's not even a specific identity that's an enemy. It's a structural position called an obstacle, a nuisance, a flea, you know, whatever it is that they think that we are. We are disposable populations now. We see a shift. This is something that what I want to really emphasize tonight is what we're doing, right, in the shift from capitalism from above, we're looking at capitalism from below, we're seeing theorization, theory from below, it's a political theory from below, which is also very much connected to an understanding of this is the black radical tradition. So you'll see like a lot, like the understanding of a structure that there's even and above is so strong when you are being crushed, when you are below, right? So you see things really clear. You can see structure more easily because it gets in the way. Structure is the landlord. Structure is the teacher that you know doesn't think that you're intelligent. Structure is the boss. Structure is the loan manager at the bank. Structure, you know, you see structure all the time. And then for those above, it's supposed to be more fluid. These obstacles aren't really supposed to be in the way. And that gets taken care of through violence. That original violence that creates even a situation of above and below. Whereas it, we could be side by side, that violence is, no, I want to be the master of you. That's that original violence is that subjugation. And this is the logic of what we're living right now. And this is what we see with the Ponca, which is the is that we are, and this is also like how we talk in the streets. We talk about the haves and the have nots all the time. This is what we're talking about. This is it, you know, th that we see that structure clearly all the time. And so what the, what theory from below offers is actual a theory. So what's a theory? So like when we talk about a, a scientific theory, a scientific theory is a, a trying to understand why phenomena keep repeating over and over and over. There's this pattern, there's this pattern, there's this pattern. What's causing this pattern? I have a theory that this is what's causing this pattern. Okay. So that's how we theorize. And so theory from below, theory from below's first question is how do I get free? <laughs> right? Not how do I maintain this situation, it's how do I get free? Because I am captive, and this is the black radical tradition, right? The fugitivity, the escape, the, the maroons. The Marunas, the enslaved Africans who ran away and created new societies with the Native Americans and the misfit Europeans <laughs> who also didn't want to be over there. You know, they wanted to live different. You know, so we have a lot of examples of this from our own struggles, our own ancestors, our own history of struggles from below, from above. From above, a lot of it is working within the, the structure and trying to maintain it, right? So like, when I talk about like the Cal States and the UCs, the UCs are the, 
the students there uh, are supposed to be the designers that maintain the structure, and then the Cal States are supposed to be the workers that keep it together. Um, so we, you know, if we can think about that fugitivity, how do we create a different house? rather than the one that pits us one crush in the other. And in order to survive, the only option that we have is to go above, which then means we are reinforcing the below, right? Like, to go above, so we get talked about like going up, you know, to uplift the race, those of us who aren't white, like what we're saying, right? To um, go up the ladder, right? Those of us who um, don't assimilate into whiteness, uh, they call us a failure, and they call it downward assimilation. <laughs> they have this term in this in sociology, downward and a proud yes, downward assimilation. <laughs> I'm with the Bobo. So Palestine and the Zapatistas come into my life as like I'm I'm like seeing both worlds now, and I have been trained only to live in one, to exist in one, and now I'm seeing and it's speaking to me. And I think it speaks to a lot of us because we've all been in the below sometime in our life. It's like, d depending on how we shift context, we are above, even if we don't want to be above. But that's how we're seen or related to because that's how we've taught, whether it's because we uh, look a certain way or have uh, more money or have a certain type of vehicle or house or whatever, you know, like there's these codes, codes of society. So um, Palestine then, comes in because I had this deep curiosity after learning about the lies of the mainstream media after the war in Iraq in 2003, how so many of us went out on the streets all over the world and it happened anyway, which revealed to us that the governments don't respect none of us. They just don't. They already have their plans, right? And we're a nuisance. We're just a nuisance to them that they have to pacify somehow. And so I backpack, I started backpacking. I, I ended up loving geography so much at Cal State Northridge. Um, I wanted to do a PhD, so then I was going to do the PhD about the Mexico-Guatemala border, because I had studied the US-Mexico border. Now I want to learn more about the other border. And so um, I started to backpack that summer before I moved to uh, North Carolina, which is where I studied. And I backpacked by myself. Um, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and Palestine. Be only because there was this book called The Lonely Planet Guide to Israel Palestine. And on the back, it had one paragraph for solo women travelers. I'm like, oh, it's been done before. Yes, I, I'll, okay, I'll do it, right? And so I went, again, not knowing anything about it. I just wanted to get, get the vibe. And you know, like I feel like I'm being lied to. I don't like being lied to. And so then that ended up just being an obsession. It was January 2006. Uh, it became an obsession because in, in summer of 2006, Israel launched a war on Lebanon. And I was in Chiapas looking for the Zapatistas in 2006. They were actually all over the country on the other campaign at the time. And I didn't know anything. I just kept seeing Easy Land. I'm like, I got to learn what that is. So I had just been to Palestine. Now I got to go. Where are the Zapatistas now, you know? And um, I saw the news, it was CNN in Espanol, and they were saying something so different from CNN in English, that they were actually giving education and background and history. And seeing both, again, like seeing both of these worlds, right? Like, and then trying to reconcile for myself what I believe. Like, I've been lied to so much. I don't know what to trust anymore, who to trust. I gotta go see with my own eyes, I gotta go catch the vibe. And that ended up making it so I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine, that I went back to school and thank God I had a really wonderful advisor, Alpha Craig, shout out. She told me to follow my heart, like, do you wanna change your topic to Palestine? <laughs> and I was like, I have to, this is all I can think about, you know, and that's how I learned. That's how I really learn is when I guide my own learning, right? And what I'm interested in, I think a lot of us are like that. Is what, and she was so wonderful and she was a Latin Americanist and she didn't know that you don't allow students to do a dissertation on Palestine because they don't get a job or nothing like that. And 
and I knew them, but I didn't tell her, but she would have supported me anyway, because I really wanted to do it, because I really wanted to see what was going on. I had come across a blog uh, written by Leila Haddad, who ended up later becoming a friend. She was trying to cross Rafa crossing with her son, and I heard, and she kept a blog of these devastating stories of, you know, people waiting just for Israel and Egypt to decide when they're going to open up the border randomly at their whim. And uh, I was going to do my dissertation on Gaza crossing, and my university told me that if I ever set foot in Gaza, I will never get my degree. UNC Chapel Hill, shout out. <laughs> <laughs> And they're following the federal government guidelines in terms of like level of travel advisory. But the West Bank was, they had just knocked down the West Bank a level because they're trying to do economic reforms and stuff. And so I ended up moving to Bethlehem um, and doing research in the archives in Jerusalem on maps because my whole question was how did Palestine get these borders that we're all just like, oh, we love Palestine, we love this map, I got it on my necklace, you know, but like, can we talk about these borders too, you know, because, you know, I just from our history, like we know borders are not natural, so how did we start, you know, and then hearing stories about like how Lebanon and Syria, those borders cut families, like we don't hear that enough. You know, there's like, there used to be so much travel, and now those borders are, they have really destroyed so much of the social fabric of just like how they have here, you know, and the ecology and of course so much, so much more. And so I was curious about, you know, if we start politics from the, if our, if our starting point for politics is borders, we're going to miss out a lot of other possibilities that we could have because borders are new. How are societies living? Like, you know, this whole modern nation state system, that I also started to question because people were saying that Palestinians weren't even around because they didn't have a nation state. Like, what the fuck? Like, who who needs that? Just because you don't have a nation state, you're no, you're not anybody, right? But that's the violence of nation states. There's 200 of them and over like 7,000 nations still in existence that everyone has to like fit in. And so languages are destroyed, you know, like speaking personally, the Maya mom, who has been split by the Mexico-Guatemala border, Mexico, after the Mexican Revolution, started this whole Mexicanization campaign and made it, like, really discourage native languages from being spoken. So Mexico, the, the, the mom peoples that are on the Mexico side no longer speak mom, but in Guatemala, we still speak mom. And that's been, like, destructions of worlds. The entire world. so like what we're living in is a situation where we're being homogenized to assimilate to fit in to something that as a as a kid of undocumented family we know this discourse of assimilation right like it's not really problematized enough uh in the schools especially so so when i go to palestine i study their borders. I study how Palestinians use maps like in really rad ways, revolutionary ways, like to really rally everyone around. Like, yeah, these colonial fucks created these borders, but like it also brings us together because everybody inside those borders has been marked for extermination. We will not allow it. You know, so, so it's been a, a rallying uh, cry. So it's like, you know, the master's tools, but using the master's tools against the master, right? Not just using the master's tools, like having a strategy this is something that Palestinians have really, ta really taught me a lot about because I go into Palestine doing this research about how the colonizers cut up the globe and how these borders are really contracts between invaders over how they're going to oversee the local plantations that we have and then the sub plantations called private property. Because this is, you know, in Palestine, not, you know, tracing how Palestine gets its borders. Palestine gets its borders after Africa gets cut up. Africa gets cut up after Europe cuts itself up. Europe cuts itself up after they cut us up over here, right? And and so so there's this whole logic of cutting up. And what is it that that, that works for? Why cut up the world like that, right? And it's very colonial logic. 
when the British go to Palestine and, and colonize Palestine, they start to map Palestine into private property law, which was so foreign to so much of Palestine. That, you know, I started to interview Palestinian geographers who have been part of the negotiations with the peace process about, you know, the use of maps because Palestinians famously had, they were in such a weak position with the, when the peace process started in the early 90s. Why? The beginning of the Fourth World War. Capital had been victorious, right? The Soviet Union fell, which means it weakened a lot of the left in the Middle East, in the region. Also, Saudi Arabia was working with, is still working with the United States to prop up really fascistic uh, Islam, fascistic. Like, and then there's like a whole battle like to, not allow that. So there's all these tensions and geopolitical tensions happening over over world, you know. So I go to a refugee camp. I live in Bethlehem when I'm in Palestine, and I live with a family. <laughs> I rent a room, and one day I come back from maybe my Arabic class, and I smell my noodles. <laughs> and it turns and then they look at me like oh my god and she she came she's not supposed to see this and they feel like really shy and they tell me that this is our food we don't really share it with the foreigners because foreigners usually don't like it you know like they they, they do coochie face to the food you know and uh, i'm like no this is like the meat eat this, you know, it's the intestine. Yeah. And so, and it's called kashat, which in Arabic, I believe it means like your gut, someone your nose. Um, and it was like one of those moments where like, you earn your stripes, you know, <laughs> but you do it because you're like, you know, you're like a Palestinian city, oh, you ate kashat? And it was, it was, I mentioned that story because I went to Palestine at a time, it was 2010 when I moved there, I moved there for a year. It was a time when there weren't a lot of non-white foreigners there. And most of the white foreigners come and, and approach the situation, like how they approach our situation. You know, like either arrogantly telling us what we're doing wrong, or feeling so guilty that they will be our servant. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> it's still the above and the below. You know, like let's not do that, right? And so when I went to Palestine, I didn't want to do that either. So the Palestinians that I really connected with were uh, some Palestinians who were really suspicious of me at first, which I really appreciate because <laughs> that meant they didn't like me just for my U.S. passport. You know, which happens a lot when you're a foreigner in other places and. So I, I, I hung out a lot in the refugee camp. And immediately they asked me to map the camp. And I was like, no, maps have ruined everything because I was over here. I'm like, we're calling my surprise. And they're like, no, you don't understand that the Israelis come and whenever they arrest us, raid our house, they show us to like basically flex on their GPS that they know exactly where we live. They have the name of our family on the building where we live. And so we don't have any maps. And so then I ended up mapping, we ended up mapping together with the youth. And um, that map ended up helping the camp a year later or so with its water issues so that it could have urban gardens in the, in the, on the roofs. And I was like, well, wow, that's how you know, like you need to listen to, you listen to the below, right? Like, um, and it was so it was so nice because it, it taught me strat like using a map as a tactic as a tool which I think is something that like it's a huge question we have right now with law with international law and it's something I became very sensitive to with with counter mapping so it was a Palestinian Edward Said rest in power rise in power who coined this term as far as we know called a counter map like yeah the colonizers map and that's a tool of conquest but if we have a counter map and a strategy, not just the map, but and also the strategy, then, you know, it's also a tool for resistance. And so that I learned the difference accompanying the Zapatistas and the Palestinians on strategy and tactics. I also went back to Che Guevara Guerrilla Warfare and you laid it out like in two paragraphs of difference, right? Strategy is your longer term plan to reach your goal. Tactics are just whatever tool or method you're going to do to advance, you're going to use to advance that plan. 
and they need to be disposable if they start weighing them down. Only use them if they're going to make you stronger the next day. Dispose of them if they're not making you, so they're making you weaker. And if you can't dispose of them, you have a problem because that means that that's become your strategy. You need to always have an outside strategy. And like with the Zapatistas, their outside strategy is autonomy, building autonomy, building their own clinic, their own school, growing their food. Like the autonomous from the circuits of capital, because being in the circuits of capital makes us dependent on capital. So that even if we're anti-capital, we don't even know how to live without capital. Like, how are we going to actually take it down? Which I think can also help us uh, understand why some people don't really want to, <laughs> you know? Because understanding that dependency, maybe lack of imagination, or maybe this is just what they desire. So um, there is so much to say, and I've already been talking for 40 minutes. Um, is there something in particular? I, I, I don't know how to narrow it down, so I wonder if maybe we can just pause and Kiki, just check in. One sec. Can we stack up the chairs and get them out of the way so some of the folks outside can kind of squeeze in? Yeah, we'll take a break. Yeah, we want to bring yeah. more people, yeah. so... No. Sorry to interrupt. That's <laughs> the, the yeah. chairs are completely stackable, so we could all just help each other stack them, and then we'll, we're going to let in some more people from outside. Yeah, there's about 30 uh, people outside. But we're going to open it up to discussion. You can ask for anything, so we want to make yeah. it so that everybody can come in. Thank you guys. I could take that chair though. I want to yeah. grab it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 It could be one long stack. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> one long one. Thank you guys. And then uh, just bring us the golden chair over here. Somebody, anybody has this golden chair? Get it out of the way as well. Thank you. I'll get it. I'll get it. Yeah. Oh, shit. I didn't know you were going to do that. It's right here. It's like, I'm sorry. Martin, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Martin. That chair doesn't look bad. Yeah, it's Sorry. Yeah. 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 Go outside. All right. Yeah. We're going to kick Martin outside. Is that what kind of story you have? Kind of story you're right in here. I'm streaming. Yeah. On the... <laughs> you have a fun chair? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we do. Oh, wow. Yes, you can step on the couch. You can sit down. Oh, oh. Hey, excuse me. Could you have the camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk, um, to open it up for any, Thank you, sorry. any questions or thoughts uh, that, that y'all might have. I don't know if somebody wants to see on the, the front row ones. I don't know if y'all want to sit on the side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for everything you've uh, taken us through and history and research. Um, I recently. <laughs> I came across some research about um, Middle East migration to Central America and specifically looking at El Salvador and a really large Palestinian community that's there now and thriving. And um, I'm half Salvadorian, half Mexican, and so I, when I came across this research, research and learning that that community is still there and thriving, I wondered so much about them. I even saw like a Valle of Jerusalem and there's statues, and, and I think that there's also communities still in Honduras and Guatemala, too. 
Um, and something about that migration that I found so interesting in how quick also sort of like, you know, erasure happened is that many of the uh, migrants who came from the Middle East, their passports were from the Ottoman Empire. And so because of racism and colorism, you know, the darker skinned Arab that was migrating to El Salvador, you know, the colonizers at the time was kind of like, oh, the Turks, the problem with the Turks. And kind of also this sort of racial, you know, discrimination to get the, uh, that they were Arabs. And I learned recently that the biggest, that the big wave of migration, most of these folks were from Bethlehem and Jerusalem. So part, I was thinking, I was like, oh, you know, my whole life I was like, I think we're ethnically Turkish. But that, that may very well be like a misnomer and that, you know, maybe my family is from maybe somewhere else, I don't know. But I just wanted to ask, you know, do you know this research? Do you know more about like the connectedness about, you know, indigenous communities also living alongside Palestinians? Like if there's other kinds of, I don't know, illuminating thoughts you have about this history? It's a sad history, but it's important to talk about. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, and it's actually connected to the my own personal experience as, as accompanying the Palestinian struggle as a non-white person and as native, and from Central America, let's say they call Central America. Um, in Honduras, movements there, I don't know about now, I imagine different now because things are, um, but, but traditionally movements there, like the leftist, anti-capitalist, you know, all that, uh, have been kind of ambivalent with the Palestinian struggle because their oppressors are the Palestinian oligarchy in Honduras. So there's like enormous assimilation that took, that took place in Latin America um, from, I mean, this is what the Americas, the colonization of the Americas project has been a play, a project where people from other parts of the world can reinvent themselves. Not everybody, like our African relatives, you know, because white supremacy is so, and of course, anti-Blackness is a corollary so strong. Um, but Muslims, you know, Jews, Europeans, you know, uh, without having like consciousness of what's going on, because the erasure, like you're saying, is so heavy, it's so strong that there's a huge contradiction where a lot of uh, a lot of folks who have been uh, who are oppressed have a chance to migrate somewhere else to become the above of others. And that's been the entire colonization of America. It's like from like the expulsion of Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, like a lot of our last names are Sephardic Jewish. Rodriguez, Martinez, you know. Speaking of last names, um, the um, in 1992, the 500 commemoration of 1492 in Chiapas, there was a, a, a banda of, of native people who took down a statue. So there were like statues coming down. It was a colonizer of Chiapas. His last name, well, his name is Diego Mazariego. In my family, there's a Mazariego. Like we all have these contradictions, you know? Like, and, you know, and there's a lot of focus on identity, uh, which is really important, but not enough focus on structure and how context shifts those identities in structure. So that's why the Zapatistas in theory from below and the Black radical tradition are so good at having us like, don't ever forget the structure as you're also understanding how identity functions within it, you know, and how identities are manipulated and managed into the divide and conquer, right? So accompanying the Palestinian movement for a lot of us non-white folks and have black compas who've accompanied the Palestinian movement and you know we have a lot of love for the struggle but then you know we're also all very flawed people that are trying to figure this out and so and in a context of divide and conquer we make a lot of mistakes but we need to talk about the contradiction to try to figure them out rather than evade them so thank you for bringing us that, that question. It's the same in, uh, like similar in Chile. Chile has the largest Palestinian diaspora population, and there's a lot of contradictions there with, with the Mapuche struggle, with the native struggle. 
but this is not at all to paint it all as just either this or that, because there's obviously uh, Palestinians in Chile with, who struggle with the Mapuche, like actually they, there are. It's just that the tendency, so like if we think more about like, where are the, ten, are the intensity strong? And how can we intensify ones and detensify others? rather than just thinking of it as binary, it's either this or that, and we're like, fuck, you know. Any other, any other thoughts or comments, questions? This is really rich. Um, hi, yeah, it's my great honor to finally meet you in person. I've read some of her papers, and uh, I really admire her research. Um, yeah, I'm also like in spatial sciences, um, so I kind of wonder, um, I try to often think about the geography of LA, like how it, um, the kind of suburban geography, how everything's compartmentalized and uh, so spread out. Like it kind of gives like a, it gives like um, some loneliness, like an atomization of the fam families, at least in some parts of LA. And uh, also like a, um, I read an article like a, attributing the the spread to. The, the um, urban sprawl to the um, to the low turnout to uh, to protest for say Palestine. Uh, so I um, I sort of wonder. Um, so you're a geographer. I wonder like how uh, are the cities and towns and villages and so on uh, organized, like spatially organized in the in Palestine and in uh, Chia Pass to to better facilitate the horizontal um, the, the kind of horizontal uh, organization of um, society. I love this. I love this question so much. Um, yeah, how can we learn right from the below? How do we actually organize, which means like designing a new world? Like, how do we learn from the wisdom of our ancestors, of our grandparents, of our parents, and about and from ourselves and our own experiences? In in Palestine, I know uh, best the West Bank because I live there, and the organization. It depends, and I wish that I would know more about how farmers have organized land, but the little seed that I got, I hope that others can do a lot more with it. Um, when I was doing you know, this research about the borders, and that's when you know, a Palestinian geographer told me, you know, it, used to, it, used to, it used to be just that true to that true. Like, what, you know, like, we could talk about it. Like, why, and now we have this whole central administration uh, is a mediator for where the border is, where before you could just talk to your neighbor. And so it depends. Uh, the bit that I know about the West Bank is that there was a whole politics of creating municipalities, which is really interesting now in this moment with municipalism as like a like a school of thought, the Bookchinian school of thought, um, that you know, organizing locally and weaving globally, organizing at the municipal level. This is a really interesting geography to think about because it it means different things to different in different contexts. So in Palestine, the creation of the municipalities is very violent. It destroys the communal fabric of like the councils that that, that make decisions, the majlis, you know. Um, but it's there as the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank is trying to create a state which has to make things really abstract in order to administer um, from above. You know, so with Chiapas, so much, I mean, Chiapas, it, a lot of it is based on land and, and land cultivation and cooperatives too, because there's different areas of Chiapas grow different kinds of plants. Um, in terms of their organization, I know more about their economic cooperation, which could be also helpful. And how do we design like a solidarity economy, we call it, or a cooperative economy? And because Chiapas is so diverse in what can grow, like some parts have grow more coffee, others grow more maize, others grow everybody grows maize, others grow more beans, or others do like uh, livestock. And so then they've traditionally organized so that they can have that um, in warehouses, and then they can distribute themselves to other places. Their warehouse, their coffee warehouse last year, two years ago, got burned down by the paramilitaries. Things are really hot in Chiapas right now, and it's 
You know, we, we, we get asked a lot, like, why do we think so much about Palestine? Why do we talk about there's so many things happening in the world? And I think a lot about Mahmoud Darwish, a Palestinian poet, who talked about how Palestinians have the, kind of like the blessing and the curse of that the, that the colonizer is the one that the whole world wants to, or gets a lot of attention. So if their oppressor gets a lot of attention, it's not really the Palestinians that are getting the attention. But it's their resistance that is forcing the attention, as we know. Um, but Chiapas, you know, and I go to Palestine and I, I talk about the Zapatistas a lot and I, I give a class on this ex declaration in the Haitian refugee camp with, with youth who, and it was incredible because I learned their um, a technique that I, I now bring here. So I, I was a professor after I got my PhD just for a couple years and then I decided to come and, and do organizing. Uh, and while I was teaching, one summer I went back to Palestine and had a, like a six-week class on the Zapatistas reading the Sixth Declaration. And I didn't want to give any homework because people don't do homework here. People don't do homework, you know? Reading like, how is that's like their third or fourth language, English. You know, like, let's read it together. So we projected it on the wall and we read it aloud and we pause and then we talk about it. And it was really beautiful because they're like, how come we don't know about this history? And it, 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 it it feels like it's here. And the Zapatistas themselves have said, like, Gaza, next to us, right here next to us, like it's, which is another thing about their fourth world war thesis is that the geography, the geography of struggle, it's not the nation state, it's not nationalities, it's those being crushed no matter where they are. It's being crushed in that context can shift. Even Europe has a below. I just learned that. <laughs> I kind of joke around. <laughs> uh, the Zapatistas went to Europe in 2021, and I went, and I had, like, Europe's never, like, my, you know, it's not my choice, I go to Palestine, I'd rather go to Cuba, I'd rather go to so, so many more interesting places in the world, because when I tried going to Europe, it looked like the postcards, you know, like, Paris, that be like, like, every photo of Paris has been taken already, and I've seen, so why did I even come, you know, and, you know, I, I like traveling where I get to meet people and learn about everyday life. Um, this one, yeah. Um, this one, I'll, I'll give, yeah, this one moment. Um, uh, but I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you belong in Europe. Well, Europe, oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, but the Zapatistas went, and they really pushed that contradiction and forced us to see, yeah, there is a, there is an above and below even within Europe, because Europe, you know, kind of like, is presented to us as this homogenized mass, that you know they're all white, but there's actually indigenous people still in Europe who don't want to be this white homogenized European subject without culture, without history, without being with the land, instead of being a consumer, you know, like here. So uh, yeah, Europe has a below too. I'm sorry, I just want to get to your question because I'm really curious. <laughs> Makes me wary because uh, as a young, as a young individual, I like to visit Chapa someday. But it seems that they're up against a lot of imperialists and institutions of power, political policing and gentrification and tourism being bought out by the same people. So I'd like to ask: Is it safe to travel right now to Chapa if the murder rates been high there? Thank you for that so much. Um, it is not safe to travel to Chiapas according to the Zapatistas themselves. They just had a celebration um, of their, uh, of their comm commemorating the 30 years of their uprising and as they invited the world they also said you also should not come. <laughs> but you know we'll send you photos and everything. <laughs> and, and people still went, organized usually it's organized through caravan because that's usually the safest way to go is to stay together in a group. Um, so it's not safe to, to go, but people still figure out a way to go. And the reason why it's not safe to go, you know, they themselves in their communities talk about it. But I, I want to give more background. Um, and this is hard to, this, is, this might be hard to hear, 
But again, we're here trying to really expose out all of the contradictions in a, a space where we're really trying to build, not destroy, right? It's, a, it's one of the specific things he feels, one of the principles is that we should build, don't destroy, but we still need to have difficult conversations. And one of them is about Lopez Obrador, who a lot of us, you know, understand, or if he's been presented as a progressive pro-indigenous uh, leader of Mexico, his inauguration, um, in 2009, 2019, God. Uh, <laughs> in 2019, um, he had like a whole smudging ceremony, very, very Mexica. Um, and, and, and many indigenous peoples do support him for sure. A lot of the working poor in the city support him. He gives a lot of like um, government programs to the, 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 the urban working poor. In terms of the rural, it's a different story because there's a lot of re-territorialization that Lopez Obrador has planned that is part of the greater, you know, global capitalist scheme of consumerism and extractivism. And also the context of Mexico is that it's it's a really difficult, heartbreaking geography, very painful geography with so much death and disappearance. Uh, the nation seems to be just broken. There is so much fear that, like, Lopez Obrador really um, it was understood as a hope. Like, we're so desperate. Like, we can't, we can't critique, you know, we can't critique him. Um, but the Zapatistas have a long history with, with him as, you know, someone who would later betray, along with a lot of the other political parties, would betray the peace process, the San Andres Accords, and with the Sixth Declaration, which is what I was, we're reading in the Haitian refugee camp, is where they talk about, you know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna talk to the below now, the below and to the left, the anti-capitalist below. Not because there's also, there's also a, a to the right, right, like the, watch out, like the, the ones that wanna be above, because just because you're below, doesn't mean that you're revolutionary, as we know, right? That's what we got to ask each other. What are what are our proposals, right? If, while exchanging grief and heartbreak and pain and love and laughter, what are our proposals forward? Is is our proposal forward to go above? Because it's going to replicate it with a, a whole other face. The capitalist Hydra, according to the Zapatistas, right? Or are we planning an escape? What are we building that we're going to escape to so that we can sustain that escape? That's the Zapatistas call. The word uh, rebellion, the no, and resistance, the yes. That's the cooperative building of you know collective work, homes, and clinics, and all of that. So they have their no, and they have their yes. Chiapas right now with Lopez Obrador more specifically, they get hit by counterinsurgency programs that break this resistance of building the other through government handouts. Government hands you get hands out food to you, then you're like, oh, I don't need to work the land anymore. I don't need land, and so like then after a while, you don't even know you don't even have land access, and then the next generation doesn't even know how to grow, and so then there's the dependency into capitalism, right? That makes it so hard then to to get out of it, and we have to admit that we need to admit that that we are dependent on, especially those of us who live in the city, because we're we're just I mean, it's criminal where our water comes from for real. You know, we here also, like, we got to go down deep in history, too, like, we are on stolen land. The first settler, let me tell you about, you learn about, you, you learn about the entire logic of colonialism with this one story about L.A., about what became L.A. In the late 1700s, the Spanish came to settle, and the way that they settled is they had their soldiers, their killers, take land and become cattle ranchers so that they could take large swaths of land with the cattle, right? And they were given out, this land was then mapped into ranchos, right? The first one being down where the port is, a very important port with, with uh, Palos Verdes, right? And then from there, private property lots get cut up. This is the situation that we're in now, like where land is privatized. And there's 
so many of us don't even have a choice of any social that we can live in. It's, you know, like this is this is capitalism, right? This is this is this is here right now. When the native Songa people were corralled into this concentration camp called the San Gabriel Mission, euphemistically, right? They were planning a rebellion. You may have seen Toy Purina in the mural. She's a healer, um, native healer of the Tonga people. Uh, she's all over LA. LA from below. LA's out of below. It's not just about LA from above. This is the below, right? So Toy Purina, famously, she was going to be part of a rebellion that was being plotted, you know, by the enslaved in the, in the concentration camp. And one of the soldiers, whose no, his name was Jose Maria Pico, he had already learned their language, but they didn't know. And so he was overhearing the entire plot and sabotaged it. And for his duty, his work to the empire, the empire changed his classification from African to Spanish. So he became white. Right? This is the story of settlers here, right? And so we need to go that deep in history if we're really trying to get to the root and we need to, you know, do it in a way that is about building and not destroying because it can be a really scary place because then we find out how complicit our lifestyles are. And I think a lot of us are feeling too like, and what does that mean for my relationships, my friendships, my family? Like there's been so many splits right now, I think that we've experienced. And, you know, for me, it's, that happened 15 years ago, like where like my whole world is completely, like I feel, I genuinely feel like I died. I just, I, I, I died and had to become somebody else. Like it was that kind of decision. And it was harder back then. There wasn't a lot of resources, a lot of support. The internet felt really small. <laughs> we used to blog. <laughs> and so they were so silly. Like right when the smartphone was coming out, you know, we were blogging and the comment section was a dumpster fire. <laughs> like, you know, like it was always like, like, do we leave a comment? Do we not leave a comment? And now like there's a block button, like fuck the comments, you know. <laughs> Um, now seeing so many people learning about Palestine especially and what that rabbit hole that's leading everybody now what the Congo to Sudan like here everywhere do it go all the way is my suggestion just from my own personal experience because it's medicine on the other side that's that outside right that's why I do this work because I need that medicine because I am part of both of these worlds, like all of us are, like, you know, we, how do we figure out, the, you know, having two feet, one foot in and one foot out, and this is this question of strategy and tactics, how do we know that we are just using the master's tools as a tool and the tool's not using us, right, like, is it strengthening this other world we're building, right, can we, you know, pull resources from that way. Can we do some harm reduction? Can we do some sub subversion? I listened to the Hello Kenyatta a lot. This is how we talked about elections, like, like cold and calculating, like don't fall in love with no politicians, you know, like. And then the strategy is this autonomy building, right? This other world. And it's so necessary because they really do feel that we are a nuisance. With this shift, and this enormous shift that's happening with automation, the wage worker is being transformed out of existence and now feeling the apocalypse of 500 years ago. Right? And so this is why, like with Bernie and Trump, we see them in their own different ways, but then end up really being the same way. Like trying to address this by make America great or, you know, trying to get jobs back, you know? So this is, this is important for us to do also in the face of climate collapse. Right? Like, I have tried as a geographer, right? Like, nerding out on maps, like, trying to figure out where can we move to? Right? And nobody knows. Like, the only thing anyone knows is that everything is now completely uncertain. That's the only certainty we have. When it, so then, where is our power, right? It's with each other. We got to keep each other close. And we was, right? Because what if we need to migrate? What if, you know, maybe we can be little islands of, of, of refuge for each other by getting to know each other from below 
building these webs, right? And we learn that precisely like from learning from our other world about how do we treat land as a relative for those of us so inculcated in the school system that has us treat it like an object, right? And that's, that's something for us now. So as I'm seeing people learning about Palestine and having their heart broken, it's a good heartbreak. It's a good necessary heartbreak to have. There's a lot more, a lot more of us now than there was back when I was doing it. When I was doing it, I didn't know anybody. I came out as an anti-Zionist very publicly at, at UNC's um, the school newspaper. I had a column. They just gave me what, a column. I'm like, well, I'm going to write about how I dated this Jewish guy. It turns out he's a Zionist. So like, <laughs> and everybody read it because people love the cheese man, you know. <laughs> and it went viral before that was it. And then Fox News wanted to like and I'm like, how oh, I'm staying much, you know, away from them. Um, but then that's when I met all these beautiful Palestinians who raised me over the internet and asked me to blog with them. And I was just talking to a compa about how, you know, when they first told me about all of these things, like, you know, they're so shocking. Um, and now I'm seeing them, but I'm, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm seeing myself. I'm seeing so many more of us with, who are truth seekers. And I think that might be the thing that joins us is that we're truth seekers because a lesson that I've had to keep learning over and over is that a lot of people want to be lied to, you know, because it's hard. It can be hard it, it, and we need to understand, even if we don't agree, right? We got to understand. And that's a very uh, Zapatista method, like the deep listening after we're, we're in the process of translating this book called Learning to Listen by Carlos Lenkersdorf, who learned Tocolaba, the Maya language that the Zapatistas speak. And that's where Mandaro Vereciendo comes from. Learn, to be by obeying comes from the Tocolaba people. And, uh, you know, he talks about deep listening. And it's not so much about hearing the words, but like listening to the heart, to the emotion where those words are coming from. Right? And so like having those kinds of practices, it's really about how are we going to treat each other different, where we respect each other? The question really is, how are we going to share this world together in this context that we're in, in this planetary emergency that none of our ancestors have ever had to confront, not even once, right? And how are we going to make everything they think is a loss into a win? How are we going to turn everything into a win, right? And this is by being in community together. It's by like really talking. I'm so happy um, for this moment to be able to encounter and to find more of us. I don't know if anyone would like the mic. Yeah. I just have a question. Uh, so you talked a little bit about like the duality of participating in capitalism, but then at the same time kind of feeling that it's kind of like alternative acknowledgments of what's happening. Do you have any suggested readings to put that into practice a bit? Yeah, the, probably the Escuelita textbooks, the little school books. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're, the Zapatistas in 2013 um, had a little school where they invited anyone from all over the world to come and and visit them and live with them for a few days and you get to see their projects you know and their life and it was pretty incredible and they gave us four books two of them are about the autonomous government and how it works another one is about women's participation and another one is about resistance and the resistance one's about their co-ops the government one the zapatistas just went through a restructuring so the government one, if it talks about the juntas de buen gobierno, the good government councils, or the municipalities, uh, the municipalities in resistance, those are no longer exist. What uh, the way that they used to exist is that well, you know, there's conversation at the village level, and this is interesting about the Zapatista Little School that I'd love to share uh, is this geography of Zapatista territory. I was in a village that used to be all Zapatista with the 1994 uprising, and then little by little, just maybe half of the village is Zapatista. 
And then I found out that even within families, there are Zapatistas and non-Zapatistas. And so I was like, whoa, because I thought like my geography of Zapatista territory was like this homogenized container of everybody Zapatista. But it's not like that. Um, and it gave me hope because I'm urban. And I'm like, yeah, I can't imagine taking over the city, but I can totally imagine leaving, you know, within the city. Yeah, we do that anyway. You know, so um, the way that then, like there's, you know, the, the everyday life, schools and food in the in, in each village and then at the municipal level which is like a collection of a certain number of villages they 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 kind of coordinate they used to coordinate government and then from a collection of municipalities they would coordinate coordinate the zone they used to have five zones and then to 12. Um, they recently announced that they did away from that like they're trying to undo a pyramidal structure in a radical way, so they turned the pyramid upside down, where now the institutionalized decision making, or now now the village level decision making is institutionalized as its own. Like every single village, every single place there's a zapatista will have their own voice be able to be heard through an assembly decision. So it's institutionalizing the below the and and then at the municipal and zonal level, those will coordinate on an ad hoc basis as necessary. And they're not called juntas de buen gobierno or mares anymore. And also they will have, um, they have plans, of course, they don't say how, uh, to make sure that they can defend themselves because they're getting shot at. With this whole, the counterinsurgency, the way that it looks like right now with Lopez Obrador is that he has this whole uh, program called Sembrando Vida, Sowing Life. and. It is like it's a program where like if you have like a, a certain amount of land at least like I think it's two acres or something like that, um, you get given a monthly stipend if you can plant these two kinds of trees. And the thing is, is that there's a lot of common land in Chiapas, the land that the Zapatistas liberated. It's common land. It's not private property, but this is a private property land titling scheme. It's a way to break the commons. The commons have always been for colonialism, whether in Palestine with the British, the British would say it in their report. Also in Mexico and throughout the Americas, in Chiapas specifically, common lands that nobody owns. Like to do milpa agriculture, like to do our traditional agriculture, we need a lot of land because we don't use the same soil every year. You know, there's a renourishment that has to take place. And that has also that's been that's been the, the 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 anger of the colonial system is this way of using land is not highly productive blah blah blah. So the Zapatistas themselves went to uh, declared the 500 year war on January 1st, 1994, um, because of you know the, at the moment that the ejido, the common lands in Mexico were being written out had been written out from the constitution, and that had been the one win from the Mexican Revolution of Zapata, you know, almost a hundred years before that. And so then, and that was in order to privatize land again with these neoliberal restructuring programs that we were talking about earlier, right? Where it's about um, making it a good business climate and not, not social spending anymore. And land needs to be privatized because the idea is to be able to sell mining concessions, for example, uh, to be able to get into the global market. So Sembrando Vida, sadly, at one of these COP conferences a couple of years back, the, the biggest polluters of the planet adopted it is this wonderful scheme to fight climate collapse, is to destroy the commons, pay people a certain amount, to plant these trees that are extractivist fruit trees too, and people are also then cutting existing trees because it's not land stewardship for trees, it's for planting new trees. And this is just the desperation that exists. Can you imagine this is native people, right? Like now having to become other in order to survive. And that's this battle. And not, you know, we're in a battle for our lives, but we're also in a battle of what kind of people we become. When we think about Zionism, our, our, our Jewish relatives are in an enormous battle for the life of what Judaism even means because Zionism hijacked it. The fascists have hijacked it in, in their name, right? 
That happens to Christianity too. Christians have been in a battle for this when Constantine the emperor made it the religion of the state, right? And that's how Zionism is understood by the Jewish liberation theologians. Like it's, it's trying to be a replacement for this, for God who was not there during the Holocaust. You know, Israel has been saying, well, this will never happen under Zionism. So like this imposter God. And so it's a huge crisis for how we're, so with Sembrando Vida, that is like with the Zapatistas, you hear a lot about this war, this fourth world war is against anything in the way of capital and against any anyone who is different because it's also trying to homogenize the kinds of people that are in the world. And you're hearing this even like right now, like with Israelis, like talking about, well, it depends on what kind of Palestinians, you know, like, it depends on what kind of the ones that they can pacify, right? Like that's, and that is global. That is global treatment. And it might be why so many of us feel so called right now to Palestine, because we, we feel ourselves, right? Maybe that's what we're feeling. I'm, that's what I'm feeling. I always feel that. I feel myself, I feel my ancestors, I feel the future. You know, they get away with this, what happened at the ICJ, they get away with this. You know, so South Africa just took Israel to the highest court possible. This is an international court of justice where it's where you take states to trial, not individuals. And the state of Israel, which was created in response to the genocide that was the Nazi Holocaust, right? And then the genocide convention that was supposed to prevent a Holocaust happening ever again. And it's not doing anything, right? Nothing. And this has been the conundrum Palestinians have been in since the beginning with this, with, with this problem of the United Nations having cut up the land anyway. Like they're the ones that cut up the land and, create, and, and created the Zionist project. The criminal Zionist project. And so Palestinians have been in this conundrum where they have to figure out, like, how do we even use international law? It's the problem. But we still need to use international law. In 2013, I was asked by a Palestinian magazine, Badin, means the alternative, to write about, because I would talk about this. You know, the Zapati says when they use international law, they use it tactically. And then they ask, can you write about this? Because we would want to learn. And it's a piece called Law as Tactic. And it talks about what we've been talking about here. Like, how do we understand how power is circulating is one of the big themes of that paper. Because when there's an above and a below configuration like we have right now, we give our rights to the supposed sovereign, to the politicians, to the representatives, and then we expect them to actually like enforce them. And then they don't enforce them because there's right, there's one thing to have a law and another thing to have enforcement which tells us something about how laws are enforced through force, right? A lot of the time, violent force, if it's colonialism, it can be people's force, too. Like, law itself doesn't have to be inherently good or bad. The Zapatistas have their laws, the women's revolutionary law, as a necessary reminder. And, you know, it'd be great if that law wasn't necessary, but it's necessary, so it acts as a reminder, so it's helpful in that way. So the international law itself is on trial right now. It's not Israel. It's the whole system that's on trial right now. And something to look out for is how are we going to make this a win no matter what happens? Because if they vote, if, if the judges go in support of Israel, that means that they can do whatever they want. They don't even have to need a mask anymore. Are we ready for that? Are we ready to withstand when they don't even need a mask? And then we need to figure out what does it mean that they think that they don't even need a mask anymore? How do we organize against that, right? Because it seems to be going like that more and more and more. Mask off. We also, hopefully, the court will rule, will rule for South Africa, just that that case is even there and that Palestinians were able to get documented on the fucking record, on Empire's record. 84 pages, like, you know, their, their palabra, their word that hadn't been heard over these last several months because of the criminal mainstream corporate media. It's on record now, and it can't be erased. And there, there's so many beautiful things about what just happened. And at the same time, we can't lose sight of the contradiction that South Africa supports genociders in Africa, right? So, you know, we need to hold that all together. We need to hold the truth together and then try to figure out what that means, right? 
the Zapatistas talk about the, the night watch syndrome. The night watch syndrome. So they, they sentinels. A sentinel is someone who like watches the, to see like if the enemy, what the enemy is doing, right? And reports back. The night watch syndrome of the sentinel, the sentinel syndrome comes when you've been in that position for a really long time and you just start seeing the same thing looping, looping, looping. And even though there's a change, like your brain doesn't want it, your heart doesn't want to change. So like you like really want to see the same thing. And they have that problem themselves, they say, and the way that they help ward it off is by doing shifts. So we need many sentinels. <laughs> and we need sentinels to talk to each other and see, is that what you saw? Did you see that? I saw that, right? And that's the thing is we need to keep looking for change and reporting that back, even if that change is so devastating and heartbreaking. In one of the recent communiques in this book, uh, the a writer formerly known as Subcomandante Marcos, now Captain Marcos, writes about his method, like he's like the ultimate pessimist, like that's his job is to be the most pessimist, like there is no solution, nothing. <laughs> But his method is that if there's two things that contradict it, then you won't need a third. Then he might be able to be convinced for some optimism, right? But the need to also be pessimistic, not to be lost in this hope, because like we get sold hope all of the time, right? But also not being purely pessimistic, because then why are we even still around, right? Why are we, aren't we fighting? Yeah. So just to then return to this book really fast. So this is a book we put together of the Zapatistas' writings on the Fourth World War. And it's available for totally for free download um, by Via Cate Press from the press. Uh, it's also, their communiques are all available on their own website. Um, we have their website on the front page. We also made it so that it's bilingual, it's side by side, so Spanish on one side and English on the other. So you don't get mad at the translators. <laughs> it's hard to be a translator, y'all. <laughs> Please send us love letters when you find an error. <laughs> It'll be collective translation. Um, and also because it can help for like language acquisition. Like it helps me to like to, to learn uh, more advanced Spanish. Because I didn't realize I have I have good Spanish, y'all. Like, you know, I didn't know there was more than one Spanish. Like, there's like we got the below Spanish, I guess, there's the above. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I was, you know, you're able to learn whichever language, and we want to be able to send a lot to our incarcerated compas. We really appreciate it, and it it talks the it has seven loose pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, the world global jigsaw puzzle, from 1997, which talks about how neoliberalism pretends it's uniting, but it's really fragmenting the world into these pieces that don't fit. One of them is like migration, just going in circles. Another one is how or like organized crime is now part of the state. You know, we see that in Mexico a lot, you know. Um, and of course, the pockets of resistance. There's always resistance in theory from below because again, the starting point is how do we, how do we escape? How do we get out of here? How do we, how do we get free? Then there's another called what are the characteristics of the Fourth World War? And then an, a really important letter in 2011 between Sub Marcos and Luis Vioro, who's a philosopher who we later all found out was a Zapatista too after he died. He's one of the most famous uh, philosophers I'm trying to get at all of these contradictions on the left in Mexico. And the letter talks about ethics. What happens if we put ethics into war, right? Then, then we would need to fight a war. We would need to be soldiers fighting a war where the whole end goal is that we don't have to be soldiers no more, that there is no need for armies anymore. Like that is the ethical position rather than keeping the above and the below, the above and the below. Like how do we, how do we annihilate the situation that even makes us be in this position? Can we just live? Can we just be? So it's really important, I think, to think about in this, this question of ethics as we're seeing, you know, we need to really think about armed resistance, you know, like, what we've been taught about it, what we ourselves think, the conditions that we're in, where con in what context it works, where, where it might not work, because it, again, it's just a tool, it's just a tactic, it's not a philosophy. Like the whole point is to get free from this violence that creates this world. And then finally, uh, after notes on wars, there's a declaration for life. A lot of the Zapatistas' discourse has been a lot about life rather than just humanity. It is humanity. 
but it's also the whole planet. It's like, and then there's a communique for Hase called of sowing and reaping that they put out in 2009 and republished in 2023. And then the communique on method, um, the pessimistic method and the contradiction. So, um, yeah, and you can get that online. You can get a printed copy here on Bookshop. We did a little trick so that you can't get it on Amazon. Hopefully that trick. Is the you you mentioned a book or I don't know if it was a series of books called Escuelita? Yeah. Is that available to read anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. If you just like do a search for. Zapatista Little School textbooks, you'll find them. It's also, I think, maybe words, maybe we, could, we should publish them, right? And like a, yeah. And they're really great to, 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 to sit in community with and think about, and they get really like detailed about, <laughs> about like the things that they've tried, and you know, that didn't work, and so then we're gonna try this other thing, you know, and not just, so I can show you like, oh yeah, like they're not these like geniuses that already have all the answers. Like it really is caminando, preguntando, like asking questions as we want. I feel like there isn't too much account. Of, I feel like there isn't too much accounts of like, you know, um, like modern or, or, yeah, I would, I would say like modern, um, like anarchist or you know, like community-based like situations like working out. Or that there's, it's not often documented enough to where like you know we can feel comfortable and enough to where we could say like, hey, this is possible. This is like something that we can mirror. Yeah. You know? Well, with that, I want to shout out. We're we're at the Eastside Cafe with other collectives that you know we're in this orbit uh, over here on the East Side. In March, we're going to have an encuentro. We welcome you all to come, and we're going to talk more about this question of urban zapatismo, urban autonomy. Mostly, yeah, urban autonomy, not necessarily zapatismo, but the zapatismo for sure. It's a it's called Año 30, Year 30. Y nosotros que, and what about us? Because that's been a question that somebody's supposed to have for all of us, like who is it? You know, and they said recently, you know, like the poetry is good, but it can't just be poetry. It can't just be artwork, it can't just be talking about like, we know that we, how are you organizing, right? And so this is gonna be a question for us in March, so look out for that. No. Uh, the 22nd and 23rd, yeah, around like the equinox. Check on Instagram the East Side Cafe. Check on Instagram the East Side Cafe. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how people are interested, but maybe it's been of a nerdy question. So you, you mentioned like mapping the field for family in West Bank. I um, also I just uh, sort of wonder um, what did generally what do you think of GIS and uh, um, how like does the that so do the Zapatists that use GIS and if so what, what's the role of GIS in, in their movement? I don't know. That's a great question. If somebody knows, like if the compas, the Zapatista, the GIS, um, the, with Palestine, GIS is really developed now. It wasn't before, but now it's like incredible. Uh, and I also want to just put out here uh, a story that we need to do something about. We're going to turn this into a win. So, um, there is, um, I did a teaching on December 11, a live. Um, about maps and stuff. So if you want to like see if you love maps too, it's on my on my IG and YouTube and stuff. And at the end, you know, I was telling the story about the the Palestinian leadership with the also peace process, how they didn't have maps, and there was a, a Palestinian compa on there, and you know, feeling really sad about oh man, we need to get our stuff together. But no, like Palestinians really got their self self together in terms of mapping. And I pulled out the atlas, huge, enormous, big heavy atlas of Palestine 1917 to 1966 like and it tells it shows you all the villages you know that were destroyed and are still there and everything and today from Thursday there was a, there's a picture that the Israeli military circulated of a soldier Israeli soldier mockingly like sitting and looking at the atlas Palestine 1917 right. to 1966 so it you know, our books, the Maya books, were all burned by the Spanish when the Spanish came here. And they're four in existence that we know of. And so when we think about books, then we're in a bookstore. It's so beautiful. We're in a bookstore because 
you know, that's usually how we find each other. We don't really find each other in, you know, in the highly produced spaces of television. Or, you know, books are a lot more affordable. They're a lot, you know, for, for all of us. I wrote a letter to Salman Abusita who created that atlas, and I hope he's all right that I'm putting him on blast, but I'm like, <laughs> that, that atlas needs to be reprinted and multiplied and multiplied all over the world. Like, how do we do that to each other's texts, right? Like, like with the Zapatistas, yeah, this is online, but also like the internet, when, the internet's not always gonna work. You know, those of us who work without it, like maybe, maybe it's just us who are suspicious of that. <laughs> no? With that? Yeah. Why are you looking at it? <laughs> you know, they're not. Yeah. yeah, but you know, like uh, as a way, you know, something in, in thinking about this question of how do we share the world, a world where many worlds fit, we need to learn about each other's world to be able to, you know, that's kind of this this trip of me going to Palestine and Chiapas and, and here is reporting back about these other worlds, right? And learning each other's texts, you know, and multiplying them. They're banning books. They're already trying to like, erase a lot of Palestine from the books here, right? Like, how do we not let them, how do we multiply like the nopal, like the cactus, which is native to these lands and really important to the Palestinian resistance too. It's, it's a sign of smooth, smooth because in their villages, they would plant the nopal and you can still, even though Israel tried to destroy them, you can still see the the, the planting of the nopal, because you know you, you cut one nopal, you just like multiply the bunch because that's how they grow, right? Like yeah, cut me up, you'll make me more, right? Like how do how do we do that with with in this war, right? How do we how do we turn as many of these supposed losses or hits into wins, you know? And that's that strategic mind um, that comes from also learning how to read power, learning more about the situation that we're in right now. Is there a, uh, yeah. Uh, no, thank you so much. Super interesting. Uh, I totally agree with you that, um, you know, there are a lot of indigenous people that seem to support uh, Lopez Obrador. Um, and I mean, I saw like a, a opinion, like, um, like a lot of, like I think 66% was his percent in Chiapas. And I'm wondering, what do you think was the, the kind of the difference? Like, what, why did a lot of indigenous people end up uh, maybe supporting this more social democratic kind of model instead of the um, other model? Like, I'm, I'm literally just trying to think, like, what were the historical processes there that made this outcome that even though, of course, you know, the organizing of the Zapatistas themselves obviously have a different ideology than then I'm going, what made the population kind of maybe go more in, in the Amla Morena direction? Yeah. Um, just, you know, my, my thoughts on it have, you know, they take deeper history and that they're in Mexico. There's a major contradiction that the book Mexico Profundo talks about. Mexico Profundo, which is the title of the English translation also, talks about two Mexicos, the Mexico, the imaginary Mexico that's like European facing, this is who you see on the telenovelas, the blonde, the white, right? Like, and the, and the ants. And the leadership, the politicians, you know? And then the Mexico Profundo, which is a Native American Mexico that the Mexican state has tried to erase by making Mexican. Like, a lot of us are Native and we don't know it. We call ourselves Mexican or Guatemalan or whatever nationality. And with Mexico, you know, with post-Mexican revolution, as I was mentioning, as I was mentioning that the that the, uh, the mom pueblos in Mexico no longer speak mom because of this Mexicanization, mestizaje campaign to just create the Mexican instead of this enormous diversity of, of people. And so that's a tension that's existed in, in Mexico and not just Mexico, but you know, and it, and it happens through um, everyday life, bullying, you know, it, it, it happens in the media, it happens everywhere, like everywhere you look in, dom in the dominant imaginary Mexico, like it's set up to like tell you that you're, you know, that, that the state doesn't like you if you're native, like, and so like, and we know that here, you know, this whole assimilation question, like everywhere, like, you know, there's codes. And so that's a that's an important background for that, and that there's been, in it, since the beginning, 
a push on these lands to get rid of Native people. And getting rid of Native people extermination isn't just getting rid of us through our by killing our bodies, it's also by killing our spirit, our heart, our, under, our consciousness that we're even Native. And a lot of that happens by making us urban. Not necessarily that you can be urban and Native, but there is an integral connection with the rest of life that the modern subject has been taught that the human is separate from nature. That's what makes a modern subject. And those of us who exist in the city, like it's set up. So we don't even have to think about nature. We don't have to think about where our food comes from. It comes from peaches coming from a can, right? Like the song used to say. You know, so <laughs> they were put there by a man in a factory. Yeah, so then with, um, with Chiapas, Chiapas today now has cartel violence that did not exist 10 years ago. Ch Chiapas used to be the safest territory. Zapatista territory was the safest because there was no government there. Um, which is very intertwined with the organized crime. Um, the Zapatistas call the, they have organized crime and disorganized crime, and disorganized crime is the soldiers, the employees of the state who have their side gig with the organized crime, the actual organized crime. So there's a disorganized crime and the organized crime. and. And with Mexico right now, with AMLO, he has an enormous, um, how you say, vendetta against the Zapatistas, historically. There was a leak of documents in 2022, September, uh, from, the, from Serena, the, the Defense Department in Mexico, that leaked how the Zapatistas are AMLO's number one problem with his development project. He's trying to build his book. He just built his Maya train, trying to build the the part of Mexico, you know, it kind of looks like a, a tail, like a fish tail, the really skinny part. That's the Istmo. There's been for a hundred years a plan for Mexico to build a canal there to compete with the Panama Canal. And now with AMLO, he's building it like as a dry canal and wanting to create maquiladoras on the south to withstand migration from Central America from coming into the United States. So he's been working with the United States. He sent a letter to Trump uh, when he was elected, letting him know he's working on this curtain. This curtain is, that's the border. That's the new border of, of Mexico and Guatemala, is the Isma, the Isma Trans Corridor. And that's what the movements are saying. See how brilliant they are and how they understand, yeah, Mexico is going to pay for that wall. Absolutely, Mexico is going to pay for that wall, not just Mexico, right? So with Sembrando Vida, AMLO really wants to, he, they can't, the Mexican government can't shoot at the Zapatistas because of international law, which is how international law can be a, a useful obstacle, but then they use paramilitary to do it. So they arm other native peoples who are desperate, right, because there's so much violence and there isn't land that people can work. And so then they, he's turning the land into private property, which is so dangerous because if you can sell alien, alien planets, sell it, like you get a bank loan or something, that means, you can, that means you can lose it. And the thing about always having land, no matter what, is that even if you don't have a job, even if you don't have a house, you're never gonna start, you're always gonna have a home, like always. Always, right? Having land is like the basis for the construction of another world. And so that's the war that we're in right now, like the loss and loss and loss of land for exploitation, for profit making, for this fourth world war, and then the land defenders who are largely native people. And that's what the theorization of the Zapatistas help us see. And they also help us see for Palestine, how Palestine fits in to this way bigger thing that is not just Zionism which has been a direct request from Compas in the camp that I work with, that we thought our enemy was just Israel. <laughs> and now we see it's a lot bigger, so we need to understand what the, is going on, right? And so that was a big impetus for republishing and publishing this book, too, so that we can try to understand what is it that we're fighting? And can we really talk about all the contradictions like in an honest way, in a loving way? 
because we all had them, like understanding that society, whatever structure it is that we have, the dominant structure favors certain behaviors of us, rewards really toxic behaviors. Sociopathic behaviors are rewarded on cap in capitalism. Like CEOs and politicians are like overly represented in the sociopathic community. <laughs> like because if you know if you don't have empathy, then you can make decisions that make money. Right? Those behaviors are rewarded. How do we create a society that rewards other behaviors? The kinds of behaviors that we want that will make us into the people that we want to be. That that is the terrain of struggle. The subject, who we are. Guacamaya leaks. What's that? Oh, the Guacamaya leaks. Oh, yeah. The, and so the leaks. Thank you. The, the leaks showed that the Zapatistas are the number one enemy for AMLO and getting in the way, but it's not because they can convoke um, the people on the ground in enormous numbers, but they can convoke the international community really fast. And that's really embarrassing for the state. And so that the Nolina for us is really important. We need to help embarrass all these fucks. Right? <laughs> All of them. Anyone else want to shoot some palabra? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, para todos, everything for everyone. Any announcements folks want to make about? For us, we, we have a pot, Zapatismo potluck and a book once a month. Next Friday, we're meeting down the street here in Boyle Heights at the San Miguel. Um, family Farm, where we're at Casa de Mexicano, and we're reading American, American Holocaust, which is a book that is really difficult to read by yourself. So we're doing it in community, and it is a book that came out in 1992 with a very controversial title. Because the Zionists said that nobody else has a Holocaust, only they do. Right, right, exactly. And so, like, a David Standard, the, the author, is real chingon. Like, he wrote, he's somebody who's like, you know, something I want to share really fast, as maybe to provoke, but also um, as hope. Like, David Standard, I've just seen too many instances of white people destroying themselves as white. It's possible, like, and like Rachel Corey for me, like when I first started to learn about Palestine, there was a white woman, Rachel Corey, who stood in front of a bulldozer in Gaza to protect a Palestinian family. And the bulldozer just ran her over and it didn't matter that she's blonde and blue eyed. And that really tripped me up because here, blonde and blue eyed people are protected no matter what. But I guess she shifted context. She went to the blow. And I think about Marcos too. A mestizo man, right, who wears a mask, like all the Zapatistas wear masks. The moment you become a target, like, you know, this, you have the same target on, the, on your back as the below does, as, as non-white people do, like you've made yourself no longer be white. There's, of course, the this, this structure that keeps wanting you to be white, right, and, but we need the current refusal. And what I mean by white, it's not phenotype. It's a structural position of I'm the boss. And I joke a lot about how I've never seen white people in Zapatista territory. People are like, no, there's white people all over the photos. You're like, and I'm like, oh, white adjective. Yeah, but not white. I'm the boss. Like that's, and, and that's like, it's a whole different feeling in Zapatista territory because those white I'm the boss behaviors are not rewarded. Like, they're not. And, and here they're rewarded all the time. So they get replicated, right? It's a whole other feeling to be in another world where we're treating each other differently. And the more of those spaces that we can create, I feel like we can help each other because then we no longer need to imagine that they're possible. Like we have already felt that we're possible. So um, you're all welcome to next Friday to talk with us about American Holocaust. Next, it will be the fire in the word about the history of the Zapatista movement. And then it will be compañeras in March. And then in March, check, keep checking the Eastside Cafe for announcements, more gatherings like this so we can figure some shit out. And two quick announcements. Thank you all for coming. Tomorrow at 1.30 with the Brown Bears of East LA, Frank's a Brown Bear there. We're reading The Hundred Years War on Palestine. 
So uh, we're on chapter four. It's a really big group and a really great discussion. You don't have to have read prior to join. So tomorrow, 1.30 here. Also, if you ask the question, come see me and I'll give you a book. And then we can figure out how to give the rest of the books out. Oh, yeah, let me go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have some books to give out. And um, we wonder who, who among you, you all would like to take a book and then maybe share the palabra, share the word with someone else. If you can commit to that, please do. And, you know, pass it around. You know, if you actually kind of, like, I, I tear up my books all the time. I write them. Some people get really upset. But then, you know, uh, maybe you can leave little notes for the next person about, like, what this made you think. So please pick, pick it up here if, you, if you'd like to commit to that see where it travels. So thank you. <laughs>